So I just want to thank uh, everybody who's here for staying here or coming back here, whatever's been happening. This has been a long day of uh, sustaining peace of the fifth annual Sustaining Peace Forum. Um, and thank you all for being here and continuing the conversations. It's been a rich and eclectic day. Um, I want to, I guess, just first begin, if I can, to thank the organizers who are probably nowhere to be found but because they're organizing. But uh, the AC4, NECR, IEEECR staff and group are, who are, I, no one's here, I don't think. I don't see any. Well, Connie's here. Connie is one of the, one of the main people. Thank, yes, let's applaud Connie. <laughs> but, uh, well, maybe, maybe they'll come in and we'll thank them. There, there they are. Well. Um, but thank, again, it takes quite a bit to organize these things, and they've been working on this for a few months. So, uh, so thanks to them. Please thank them when you see them afterwards at the reception. Um, I wanted to also uh, uh, just take a moment to recognize someone who passed away this week who uh, was um, uh, really started this process that got us here. There's a man named Morton Deutsch who was an emeritus professor here. His, most of his career was at Columbia University. He was one of the most eminent uh, peace scientists, peace psychologists of our time. Um, and uh, he spent his career here. Uh, he founded the center, the Morton Deutsch Center, International Center for Cooperation and Conflict Resolution. Um, and um, and trained me and trained many of us and really is the reason why these organizations, uh, these three organizations that sponsored this today, uh, principally um, AC4, IEEECR, and NECR, uh, exist today. Mort was 97 and he, when he passed away, he um, was ready to go and uh, he was a devout atheist and believed in doing good work while you're here on this world. And so he put his energy and his time into rigorous science on issues of peace and constructive conflict uh, and into growing leaders of leaders, into really supporting students to go on and change the world. And, and he has had a tremendous impact on me and all of us, um, and he'll be sadly missed. But his work and his, his life and Mort lives on through our work um, and as all of us go forward. So I wanted to take a moment to recognize him and, and uh, thank him for everything he did for us. Um, so this panel is on the refugee crisis, the global implications of the refugee crisis, we're saying. I think we could say crises because there are multiple crises that are contributing to this thing that we're calling the crisis. Um, it's particularly acute uh, now, but is obviously something that goes on all the time and that we don't pay enough attention to, I think, until it reaches a crisis level and is uh, attended to sufficiently by the media. Um, it is obviously caused by a variety of factors, but principally war. And this is a, a, a forum on sustainable peace and trying to understand this. And so we're ending with this session, which is really talking about one of the most severe consequences uh, of the lack of peace, um, war. The, our, um, I'm going to introduce um, our moderator, uh, Laura Satraken, who is an outstanding journalist um, who had covered the Middle East for many years <clears throat> for ABC and various other um, venues, is a youth global leader, um, has won a variety of prizes, uh, and has been kind enough to come and agree to sort of chair this panel, and she will uh, introduce... Um, the panelists. Thank you, Laura. I am so glad and grateful to be here. And I love the feeling that I get um, from sitting up here with these four individuals, which I would describe as the feeling of abject humility. I think journalists are a species who like to feel like they're always among the smart people in the room. I gave that up a long time ago. And it was from experiences like this where we have with us four people that I sincerely believe one can say no one knows more than they do and no one has done more than they have on the global refugee crisis. As much, perhaps, but no one more. If we have such a thing as global citizens, I believe 
these four people are global public servants. And I use that to span across government, advocacy, um, and nonprofit work. As some of you know, I'm the publisher of a platform called Refugees Deeply, which is part of a broader array of sites called News Deeply. The true house experts at News Deeply on this subject are based in Athens and Beirut. I simply represent them and carry their questions. But um, I feel the great humility with uh, being their representative as well, because it's their great work you find on Refugees Deeply, and that is chronicling this crisis. We are to start with 10 minutes from each speaker sharing their thoughts on the global refugee crisis. Um, and from there, we will go into a little bit of dialogue and then open up for your questions. So with that, we begin. I thought we'd begin with Alex Elenikov, who has served as the UN Deputy High Commissioner for Refugees in Geneva, and before that, in a long, illustrious career, focused on immigration policy in the United States. And I've asked him simply to weigh in on this question of what's working and what's not working in the response to the global refugee crisis. Thanks, Lara. Glad to be here. What's um, not working is a lot longer list than what's working <laughs> at the moment. Um, thinking about the relationship of uh, peace and refugees, and uh, I'll, I'll coin an aphorism if one is allowed to. Maybe you can only quote an aphorism. You can't sure. coin an aphorism, but uh, we're. <laughs> Where peace ends, refugees begin, and where peace begins, refugees end. Um, we, we know that the majority of the people who have been forced to flee their homes have been forced to flee across borders because of conflict and violence. And that we can establish an international system that works in that regard if conflict ends or if uh, there's a way of taking care of people in a, in a durable way where they end up, and that's where the system has failed. None of the major refugee-creating conflicts uh, are, look like they're ending anytime soon, Syria being the most obvious example, but also South Sudan uh, and Afghanistan and northern Nigeria, and we can go uh, around the world. If people can't go home in safety because the conflict hasn't ended, then the other two traditional solutions for refugee situations are movement to a third country, resettlement, uh, or integration into the country that has granted them safety and asylum. But neither of these options is working either. Uh, the global north has basically shut its doors to refugees. The EU-Turkey deal in Europe and the reaction of Europe putting up walls and basically Threat, really threatening the existence of Europe because of the refugee flow. Uh, Australia deflecting refugees, spending more on putting refugees in detention than the entire UNHCR budget for a year. Uh, and the United States, the last hope for most refugees around the world, the leader in refugee protection is no longer. Uh, what got most of the attention was uh, the president's ban on pe anybody coming in on any kind of visa to the United States, but what, what also happened was a four-month suspension of the refugee program. But much more serious even than that was the cut in refugee admissions from 110,000 to 50,000 with absolutely no explanation from the White House as to why that was necessary at a time of the largest refugee numbers in the world for the past generation. So on the resettlement side, there's very bad news indeed. The North has closed its doors. And on the local integration side, that is attempting to help refugees become full members of the society that have taken them in, the news is not any better. And that's understandable. When a country like Lebanon, a country of four million people, takes a million refugees in, and Europe takes a handful, other than the asylum seekers that got to Germany before Germany closed the door, the United States has cut its numbers dramatically. You can imagine why asylum countries uh, are unwilling to fully integrate refugees into their societies if there is not a, a sense of global responsibility sharing. I've called in things I've written the situation uh, the, the, the second exile. The first exile being when people are forced in their homes and the second exile being that they're not welcome anywhere else. They're allowed to come into a country but their kids are not put in the schools, they have difficulty ac accessing social benefits, and most importantly, they're not given the right to work and take care of themselves. So they rely on decreasing amounts of assistance over time, and that produces this second exile. 
So what the main problem we have is actually not the flows across uh, across oceans and into the global north. And in fact, I would I would disagree with the use of the word crisis to describe what's happened in Europe. It's simply a management problem that could easily be solved with a little bit of of uh, will. The numbers are not overwhelming for a continent of 500 million people. Uh, but the problem are these protracted situations that go on and on and on where kids grow up in refugee camps or grow up outside of camps in settlements or in, in marginal existences in, uh, in large cities. And they don't end, and refugees don't end. So what might we want to think about doing about that? I, I think there is a growing recognition of what needs to be done. And this starts in the, the so-called New York Declaration, which was adopted at the end of uh, the conference uh, last September at the UN. Uh, it was adopted by the General Assembly. It was signed on to by all the states of the General Assembly. And it basically said, we need to think about new ways of working with refugees. We need to put together development and humanitarian organizations. We need to assist uh, hosting communities to give them more assistance for the work that they've done in taking care of people. We need to respect people's human rights. We need to come up with responsibility sharing systems that, that mean that other states other than the states bordering the countries in conflict uh, shoulder the burden. And we need to change these policies of keeping people out. Um, we seem to all know that's where we need to go uh, and yet um, we don't have an easy way of getting there. This is a tough time in the global north with the populist politics that seem to be driving much of the political debate so that even the, the folks of the moderates or the liberals feel um, un unwilling to press significant reforms in the system for fear of uh, political defeat at the polls. Um, so what, what do we need to do here? I, I think this actually is a moment um, where accountability has to be demanded of the states that have created the refugee regime. Refugees are a function of states. They exist because states haven't taken care of their people, and they exist because they're international borders and other states, which means there's no safe place for refugees to flee to unless another state le lets them in. So refugees are a function of the state system. And it's up to the states to be held accountable to solve the problem that they have created. But how do we do that in a world dominated by states with the multilateral and international organizations obviously are run by and for states? Well, two suggestions I have on this. Uh, one is a, a global campaign on refugee rights. The Refugee Convention adopted in 1951 has a wide range of rights. It's a major human rights document, as I mentioned, the right to work, the right to practice a profession, the right to practice your religion, the right to education, the right to access to social benefit programs, and many other rights are in the convention. But it's widely ignored, widely violated. In almost every country, it's violated. Uh, uh, and there needs to be litigation where it can be brought on behalf of refugees uh, to enforce rights. And there's some successes here. In Kenya, for example, when uh, the Kenyan govern government announced that they were closing the largest refugee camp in the world, the Dadaab camp, and telling all the Somali refugees that it was time to go home, a lawsuit was filed in Nairobi, and a lower court judge blocked the removal and the ending of the camp, uh, saying it violated international law and Kenyan constitutional law. And one hopes that survives on appeal. We've seen the same thing in this country, where lawsuits stopped the president's uh, order, at least on the visa side. Uh, and there are other examples in Malaysia and Ecuador and elsewhere. But this needs to be pulled together by, by smart folks and, and activist lawyers around the world, it seems to me. And the second is there needs to be a political movement here um, by and on behalf of refugees. Hannah Arendt wrote many years ago at the close of World War II, that, that what refugees really suffered was a lack of a voice. No one had to listen to them. No one had to pay them attention. No one had to take their interests into account because they belonged to no political society. And that continues to this day. It's somewhat startling, if you think about it, that the body that governs UNHCR, the executive committee, made up of almost 100 members of the United Nations, there's not a single refugee representative in this governing body. Refugees have no voice in the governing of the international refugee system. Refugees have no formal representation at UNHCR. Refugees can't vote even in countries where they've been refugees for generations. 
So there needs to be political work done, and there needs to be political work done by the supporters of refugees. And I, that may sound crazy, but I think we're at a moment where that is actually possible. I think we can imagine it now in the kinds of broad-based anti-populist movements we've begun to see around the world. I was just in London last week, and there was a major march downtown about a number of issues, anti-discrimination, et cetera, et cetera. But a lot of the signs were about refugee rights which was not what one would imagine. In the United States, you see signs that say, no ban, no wall. And that refers to both not building the president's wall on the southwest border, but also getting rid of the ban on uh, people from coming from, from certain Muslim countries. Again, that's a remarkable joining of Latino and Muslim activists with others that we haven't seen before. So I think the, the populist movements around the world is going to lead to a uh, a counter movement here that we need to work on on behalf of refugees that empowers refugees transnationally through media that Lara can tell us about. There are lots of ways that people can communicate now. But we're not going to win this without a fight. We're not going to win this because states decide it's nice to be human humanitarian. We're going to win it through law, through courts, and through political action. Thank you. And creative inclusion, it sounds like. Um, before you go, from the mic. The, uh, <laughs> when US policy is recalibrated toward what one might describe as inhospitable or outwardly hostile, how does that ripple through the global system? What do you think changes globally? Well, the, the United States has always been a leader on, on refugee protection. It's the largest contributor to UNHCR. We hope that continues. Who knows? It's been a leader in terms of resettlement. It, resettles more refugees, it used to resettle more refugees than, than the rest of the world combined, that's gone. And that is taken note of uh, around the world. The Europe will say, if the United States isn't taking anybody, why should we? In terms of resettlement, if, UNH, if the U.S. is no, no longer committed to funding uh, the U.N., why should others? And it also means that the efforts that the, the U.S. has played traditionally in lobbying on a bilateral basis with states that they better protect, that they protect in a better way refugees, I don't think those efforts are going to go forward, which will mean that, that any kind of moral, economic, or other kinds of pressure the U.S. can put on recalcitrant, recalcitrant states that deny people's rights, I think will be lost because I think this is an administration with absolutely no interest in pursuing these things. But the, the good news on this is that the administration represents a minority view in this country. The polls overwhelmingly show you a, a popular support for refugee programs, popular support for immigration programs, legalization of, uh, of uh, undocumented uh, migrants who've been here for a long period of time. And that has to be tapped into. Um, I think the, you know, yeah. So, Thank you. Yeah. Our Next speaker, Anya Fay, the President and Chief Operating Officer of Concern Worldwide, also a lifelong and decades long public health practitioner in the field in Bangladesh, around the world. Um, so really a view from both the mechanics of refugee aid and the trenches of aid delivery with some prepared marks to kick us off on some reflections you'd want to share. Okay, thank you. Sorry. Um, I, I suppose without overburdening probably a very learned audience and statistics, I mean, at the moment, there are over 65 million people displaced in, in the world. And, and this happening really, I suppose, at the same time as there's persistent disregard for international humanitarian law. Let me shift your microphone three Sorry. inches over. Yeah. And international um, humanitarian law and international human rights law, um, you know, that really leaving deep scars on humanity. Um, parties to conflict really attacking civilian, civilian infrastructure and impeding life-saving assistance. I mean, the, I, I could go on with all of, the, of the, uh, the laws and the climate of impunity really that comes with that. And, you know, and this in turn means that many of those displaced are unable to return home. Um, you know, and that, that really what we have to keep in mind in terms of, of the, the refugees, is that overwhelmingly, it is the countries bordering these countries of conflict that are bearing uh, the burden of refugees. They're usually countries that have uh, far less resources um, to do so, um, and maybe in some cases themselves suffering conflict and, and emergencies. Um, you know, and I just very recently, just two weeks ago, returned from a trip to 
visit concerns programs in Lebanon and Turkey. Um, and again, to, to uh, what Alex said now, a, a country like Lebanon taking over one million refugees, a quarter of their population, um, and expected to provide the services to those refugees when their own country in many ways is struggling. Um, and, you know, the refugees are not allowed to work. Uh, and I suppose the horror really of the circumstances under which people are trying to, to survive um, really struck me very strongly. And I would say the same, um, you know, in Turkey, and I suppose in both countries, in Turkey with 2.8 million refugees in, in the country, is really um, looking at some of these long-term solutions that, that Alex mentioned, you know, the need for integration, the need to provide services to the host communities so that you're not creating even greater um, differences between what a refugee may be entitled to because they've crossed a border um, and what local communities really are, are the, the pressure that's on the services that they had. Um, and, and I suppose witnessing what refugees can often receive while local communities um, have, have very little. Um, and I suppose the other thing, even though I know we're talking about refugees here today, I suppose the other thing that I think we need to really keep in mind is that many of the most vulnerable people affected by conflict never cross a border. They neither have the means to do so because they're elderly, they suffer from disability or health issues, uh, they're female-headed households with young children. Um, and, and, and the differences in how these two populations are treated, I think, is, must be noted. If you cross a border through laws that exist, you're entitled to assistance. If you don't cross that border, you really are left to, to your own devices. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that, um, you know, and, and addressing then displacement and, and, and refugees I talk about in this sense, again, it's, it's looking at this <clears throat> new way of working, the, you know, is, is to look at how do you integrate local communities, host communities with the refugees, how do you provide services that provides for both sides of these populations um, in an effort really to prevent the social exclusion that can occur um, and discrimination. Um, around that. Um, I think, again, what I would like to say about the, the um, situation with the US government closing its doors to uh, the vast majority of refugees, you know, it is giving permission to many of the countries that are hosting refugees to consider doing the same thing. If the US, a leader in the world, can do this, why can't we? Why can't Pakistan send the Afghanistan refugees back? Why can't Kenya send the Somali refugees back? And it could go on and on. And what arguments can Western countries, rich countries make if America and Europe close their doors? Um, There's a lot to say there. I have, I have a lot to say, but, but I think maybe yes. that's... It, yeah. You have such, in addition to your high level observations, you had an up close look and have had for some time in a place like Turkey or Lebanon or anywhere, but you've just been there, where the formal systems and informal systems shape the lives of refugees, whether you get into that track at all yeah. or whether you're completely on your own. I think, you know, and, and Turkey maybe is the example that, that, I, that I would use there is that, um, you know, for the first few years, maybe the first three or four years of the war, um, the borders were open. Refugees crossed in a sort of a legal manner, so to speak. In doing so, they were registered by the Turkish government and therefore entitled to the services uh, of health and education particularly. Um, after that, the borders closed. People still crossed in large numbers, but they were crossing in illegally. And in order to be registered, which would then allow them access to services, it is a complex and incomprehensible system for somebody who's also struggling with the language. Um, and so what you're finding is that there are a lot of people, and again, they're the more vulnerable group. They're the ones that waited until the very end, so to speak, although we're nowhere close to an end, um, to cross the borders. And I suppose I would just tell you one small story that I came across, a young 18-year-old who was born with a hole in her heart that went untreated in Syria. Um, was, she was not expected to survive infanthood, and she did. Um, and at the beginning of the war, the family made a decision because of her health condition not to cross. 
Um, and then the medical systems fell apart and there was no ongoing treatment for her. Um, and so they, they made really the treacherous journey uh, to get into Turkey. They did make it. But she was left in this catch-22 situation. She needed health services, but she wasn't entitled to them without being registered. And she couldn't register because she hadn't crossed legally. And, and it, was, it was just, it was a mire, is all I can say, the systems that they had to go through. And, and happily, she did ultimately get assistance. And I think by dint of a doctor who decided to live by his oath, he wrote a letter. He just understood, said, I will write this letter and see if it works and then find an official who would accept the letter that wasn't quite legal. You know, but she had help from an organization like Concern to, to get her to that point. There are so many more of them that have no assistance. And therefore, in not being registered, they can't access school for their children. Uh, they don't get these, um, the aid from UNHCR. There's a whole series of things that they don't get. And they live then in isolation because of the language barrier. So they're stuck in very small homes for which they're borrowing money to pay rent um, with nothing coming in. Right. And I think that really uh, it's a stain on the world. Ripe for predatory behavior. Yes. We'll yes. stop. We'll keep it there. But the, um, you've seen people with all kinds of wounds. And I'm going to ask Adrian the same question later. But what happens when health delivery breaks down or is never available? What does it look like when within a population you have a segment of people who have no health or care and or access? You know, what, what does it mean for them and what is the broader uh, outcome? I mean, really, uh, you know, I, I think... We're so privileged in many ways. I think we find it really hard to understand what it's like not to be able to walk down to the local pharmacy. Yeah. I was given a snapshot recently with, with the words, no maxi pads. <laughs> so that made it real. And, but, you know, and, and again, a family that I visited and um, the elderly gentleman of the family had had a stroke. And again, they had no access to health services. Um, he was incontinent. He was lying in the corner of a room with an elderly wife doing her best. He was, apart from the paralysis of the stroke, he was now suffering from paralysis because of lack of movement, lack of physiotherapy. Very small things, you know, um, that had somebody told his wife, you know, move his legs regularly. It won't make him walk again, but it would keep his muscles moving nothing for pain, and he was obviously in severe pain. You know, and you look at it and you sort of, you innocently put the questions around, well, you know, why can't you get medication? No access to pharmacies, no language skills, even if they could get access, no money. The list just went on, you know, and, and you can help out. You can help out individually, daily, but it's an ongoing problem. You know, unless there's somebody there every day, every week, giving them some sort of assistance in order to help them overcome that situation. And, I, and I'm just talking one family. I mean, the war wounded uh, inside Syria who have now no access to health service or very limited access to health services. Um, again, I think beyond our comprehension. And I think that my sense in the US and Europe is we've almost become numbed to the pictures and the stories that are coming out of a country like Syria at the moment. That, you know, and, and again, you have these natural disasters that Alex referred to. You have South Sudan, Somalia, Yemen, northern Nigeria. And whether we like it or not, natural disasters get more funding at the end of the day. They get more airtime, although it's not getting much here at the moment, but in general, you know, and what will suffer will be particularly the crisis in Syria, that there is no end in sight for, really. I'm, someone can write their PhD thesis on disaster natural disaster response, refugee response, yes. and the way the mechanics mm. of both reflect each other and are broken in different yeah. ways. And, and I'm going to give you one very small example. In three weeks after the Nepal earthquake, we raised more public money than we have raised in six years the Syria crisis. We it's, weren't paying attention to it in the mainstream for the first three and a half years. So it's telling, yes. <laughs> but um, Adrian Frick, 
Fricky. Fricky, fricky. excuse me. That's okay. It's the tricky it's silent. It's tricky, fricky. Okay. Um, <laughs> senior fellow at the Harvard Humanitarian Initiative, visiting scientists at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health, and involved in a wonderful organization, Physicians for Human Rights. Before sharing what you had intended to share, anything you want to add to what happens when health breaks down or isn't available? Um, sure. Well, it's very relevant here. Can everyone hear me? I have kind of a loud voice. It's, I think, uh, it's a terrific question, and thank you so much for giving me a chance to um, speak about it today with this incredibly esteemed panel. Um, I think it's challenging for us, sitting in New York City, to imagine, unless we've had a lot of field work, exactly how debilitating the lack of small medical and social supports can be. And um, if we think of health systems as proxies in some ways for political systems, they are mechanisms for building trust. One of the important things that states do is provide access to health services and to education, and those are the two areas that I am passionate about. And I think um, that in a conflict setting, we often don't think about indirect mortality. There's a lot of focus on direct mortality. War wounded, people who have been um, killed in the course of attacks. However, indirect mortality is actually the lion's share of the suffering. And unfortunately, in Syria, there's a troubling trend that, again, echoing what Anya had observed, that there's an erosion of the law of targeting in international humanitarian law. And what that means is that for those, I, I'm sure there are many of you who are scholars of international humanitarian law, and in fact, Professor Elenikoff, I'm sure, teaches it. Um, but for those who are newer to the conversation, there. The law, international humanitarian law is really the law of permissible violence in war, right? So it's not to be mistaken with human rights law. But it does say that there are certain categories of buildings and people, including those that are related to education, health, and religion, that should be observed as neutral and that they have a kind of special place, and in particular, medical care. So in uh, the sort of late 19th century, there was a terrible battle in Solferino. 18th or 19th century? 19th, I think. Not the 18th, that's too Google early. It, At any rate, a very a lovely Swiss gentleman, Henri Dunant, observed that there were terrible casualties during a battle because people could not reach any medical care. So there was unnecessary suffering and death. Now, that was from direct mortality, and that is sort of the foundation of the impulse, and here, again, echoing what we've already heard from our speakers, of individuals who take a stance and make a difference, right? So uh, Professor Deutsch, who started the program that hosts this symposium today that was referred to at the beginning of this lecture, um, the doctor who wrote the note, and I think the lawyers who are mounting strategic litigation are all individuals who are actually making a difference against what I think we all know is a tide um, of terrible policies. Um, but the, returning to the, the notion of ICRC and IHL, attacks on hospitals and on doctors who are doing their jobs as doctors are impermissible right, during war. And there are lots of legal loopholes and reasons that um, this may or may not ever get litigated. However, I think that we, as a world community, know that it is wrong. It's wrong to kill sick people. It's wrong to kill doctors who are tending to their needs. However, it is very efficient, cynically so, as a strategy. Because if you kill a doctor, you're not only killing a physician, you're killing all of the people that person would have saved. And so it is, an, unfortunately, a very effective way of killing large numbers of civilians who may or may not support a, an opposition. And that 
is the set of questions that I work on. I'm very interested in making that phenomenon legible because I think one of the functions of the Syrian war, which is so complex and increasingly horrible, um, to the amazement of all, um, and I, one of the reasons that I'm such a fan of Syria deeply is that it really allows um, an entrance into the discussion about Syria, which uh, has occasioned the largest displacement of humanity since World War II and has remade the face of the Middle East. Um, the impacts, political, economic, and social, as well, obviously, cultural, are enormous and will be felt for the next 50 years. And I'm we're gonna only ask doing. you about something yeah. that is somehow, to me and you, so obvious because we were watching the polio outbreak in Syria. Ugh. But I just want to go to there for a second yeah. as you, again, this high level thinking, pandemic risk, outbreaks that we thought were. How do you even square the fall apart with the true concern and risk of what happens to human health that can transcend Syria? Yes, that is, <clears throat> that is a very sobering question. The, for those who may not be, have followed this problem, there is a phenomenon in Syria in which areas of the country no longer receive vaccines because vaccination points are bombed or vaccines are not allowed to cross. So part of the problem is, um, as I'm sure my colleagues could speak much more intelligently, is a problem of delivery and cross-border and cross-line delivery of vaccines. Another problem is the fact that vaccination points as well as bread lines and hospitals are increasingly hit. Well, it's hard to prove the intent for targeting, but certainly it is the case observable that they have been hit multiple times, which has a chilling effect on people wanting to bring their children to be vaccinated. It also has a chilling effect on vaccinations because there no longer is a place to be vaccinated and the people who are vaccinating have been killed. And the problem is that diseases such as polio, or I suppose in Syria we have to say acute flaccid paralysis because in order to attest to the fact that it's polio, you have to have proper testing and that testing is not available. However, we can surmise from the clinical presentation that there has been a resurgence of this terrible disease that had all but been eradicated. And as you can imagine, as people flee Syria, as Anya said, sort of the, the most desperate, the least advantaged people with the fewest protections are also most likely to be those who've had the least medical care. And because they've stayed, for example, in besieged areas with very, very little access to medical care. Um, and I've been very privileged to work and, and speak with Syrian physicians who continue to provide care in extremely harrowing circumstances, including the only, the last remaining um, female OBGYN in Eastern Aleppo, who uh, was describing a caseload of 80 patients a day and a spike in cesarean sections because people want to give birth when it's safe. B, they don't want to wait until the time happens. And so this kind of, so there are the, the very drastic epidemic issues. There are the surgical issues, which are profound, the war wounded. And then you have what the sort of vast um, group of non-communicable diseases. Uh, something that a colleague of mine at HHI is working on is diabetes in refugee populations. And the link between tuberculosis and diabetes has, there's a rich, literature on this. And tuberculosis is, of course, an infectious disease, but there is an important link between tuberculosis and diabetes, and the health impacts of diabetes can be drastic when not treated. So I think in some ways, um, without invoking a parade of horribles, um, <laughs> <That's> hard. <laughs> which is very, very difficult, I think the answer is to pay close attention to the things we can do. And also to know that you as individuals can make a difference by highlighting 
things that are important to you. I mean, I, I think that we understand, I think ultimately the how of dealing with refugees will come after there is a greater discussion of the why. And Anya invoked sort of the stain on humanity. Ultimately, I think we have forgotten some of the really hard-won lessons of the last century. We're humanity. The stain's on us. Yes. But Adrian, if I may, one more teeny question, yeah, Paul. Sure. When those who think about the health of the greater population, pandemic risk, infectious disease, being those systems that are also failing to provide, is, is it sparking that alarm of authorities recognizing that if they neglect these populations, they're putting everybody at risk? That tuberculosis, especially lately, potentially morphing into one that cannot even be treated? You would think so. Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> However, okay. politicians, not only here but everywhere, are sometimes resistant to reason. And there are uncomfortable truths. And one of them is that it is hard to mobilize resources for preventive measures. That is a sad truth. And we pay a large price when we, we ignore it at our peril. Um, we ignore the impacts of the burden of non-communicable diseases and communicable diseases uh, because they will ultimately affect host countries. Um, and the other true thing is that phenomena that affect host countries will affect us. Americans. Americans in the United States. Um, and I think it can be hard for people, for example, I'm from Nevada, and people in rural Nevada have a difficult time grasping that truth. And yet, it is true. Because these conversations about burden sharing are extremely live um, at the international level. It's, and they will yeah. affect us. It's hard to say this sentence the way I'm going to say it, but we are incubating antimicrobial resistance deeply. <laughs> and at some point, it should be easier to explain to Nevada <laughs> what it means. Yeah. Um, Anne-Marie Gray, the CEO and Executive Director of USA for UNHCR, you do incredible things. And you do have to think about the global refugee crisis. But you also work to mobilize the United States in support of what we'll continue to call the global refugee crisis. You have some remarks. I also just kind of want to know how it's going. Okay. How's it going? <laughs> um, so tonight I will be addressing a few critical points on the challenges and opportunities of mobilizing American interest in the refugee crisis and how my organization is playing a leading role. Um, the refugee crisis is the greatest humanitarian challenge of our time. We've heard that a few times tonight. Um, we've heard a figure of 65 million people worldwide who've been forced to flee their homes. Um, this is unprecedented. Um, we're seeing numbers we haven't seen since the Second World War. And sadly, nearly half of these are children. Uh, and that's my personal uh, interest here and kind of a, a, a string, a theme through my, my work and what brings me to this. Um, the numbers have been growing, and we, we throw the number of 65.3 million around. That's the 2015 number. 2013 is 51.2 million. Uh, in 14, 59.5 million. 15, 65.3 million. And we'll be publishing a new global trends report in June, and I anticipate that the numbers is, are going to continue to grow. So it's not just a one-off. This is a growing problem. It's not going away quickly. 54% uh, of all refugees come from just three countries. That's Syria, Afghanistan, and Somalia. And despite what Americans see in the news, the fact is it's the developing world that is carrying the burden. 85% of refugees are in developing countries. And despite what we see in the media, the majority of these people are not in refugee camps, but in urban settings as well as refugee camps. And the situation for urban refugees, there are no safety nets in many cases. Um, refugees do not want to be in camps. Uh, they want to go home. We are seeing critical emergencies in Africa, the Middle East, in the northern triangle of Central America that aren't getting the attention 
that's, that's needed to drive support. Without media attention, it's very, very difficult to do the work my organization does. Um, the situation in Africa is spiraling out of control. More than 1.6 million refugees from South Sudan have fled to neighboring countries, and just last month the UN declared a state of famine in that country. We're seeing famine conditions in northern Nigeria, now coming into Uganda, Kenya, Yemen. Uh, Yemen, we have nearly two, uh, 20 million people requiring humanitarian assistance for the most basic of needs. These include nearly 300 refugees who are seeking refuge within Yemen, coming mostly from the Horn of Africa. Uh, this is a, a crisis that is growing, and millions are on the brink of starvation. And we and our media are focused on our internal issues here. This month also marks, as we know, a grim milestone in Syria, six years of war. Nearly five million Syrians have been driven out of their country. Millions more remain trapped. We've heard some of these stories here. And a generation of children that we have, for all intents and purposes, lost. South of the border, gang violence and drug trafficking are forcing thousands of unaccompanied minors to flee the Northern Triangle of Central America, you know, countries that include Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador. We very rarely hear of these unaccompanied minors who are often in detention. So everywhere we turn, the needs are immense. The numbers are daunting, but we need to remember behind these numbers, I work for the UN, we're great with numbers, um, but each of these represents a person, an individual that has their own story. They have a dream and they have a hope for a better life. And one part of the challenge in mobilizing American support is overcoming the sheer scale of the problem, the numbers, and demonstrating to Americans that they individually can have an impact. And what is that impact? And what can the call to action be that's meaningful beyond just donating funds? Now, we're aiming to try to contextualize the refugee crisis with narrative. Um, not only do we believe we need to tell the refugee stories, but more importantly, and I'm going to come back to something Alex said earlier, how do we allow and encourage and provide the opportunities for refugees to tell their own stories? Um, we approach this uh, through storytelling. We talk about humanizing the refugee experience and changing the narrative. And we do this through a lens of help, hope, and home. Help is the traditional way. We talk about the immediate life-saving needs and how Americans can make a difference. But we felt there was a very, very different story to tell, and that's the story of hope. Um, often a refugee, if they're in a camp situation, will be there for 19 years or more. How do you provide hope for people that can't work? Can we do that through job training? Can we do that by fighting for work permits, language and education? Can we give them access to internet, to connectivity? How do we prepare them for a brighter future? And ultimately, we need to tell the story of home. Resettlement, yes, resettlement numbers, but often the situation is they'll never return to their old home, but how do they um, become integrated into a host country? Um, these are, in many cases, uh, the world's most vulnerable people. Uh, the current crisis has been quite politicized in this market, and despite that, we know that there's a great spectrum of American support for refugees. We have hundreds of thousands of supporters that are constantly seeking new ways to reach people and to provide meaningful ways of engaging them. Thanks to Alex Lenikoff at the end of the <laughs> table and Ari Wallach, we have a special unit uh, housed here in New York called The Hive. It's recently been recognized as one of the top 10 most innovative groups in the not-for-profit sector in the US. And what we're doing there is using data and a data-driven approach to identify what kinds of people might be open to engagement on the refugee issue? Who are those persuadables? What are the right platforms of communicating with them through the right messages? This means that people that might not raise their hand to support refugees, but have raised their hands about issues they care about, be it climate change or LBGT rights, can come through a step, series of engagement to the refugee issue. 
Um, we're exploring partner new kinds of partnerships to talk about the impact um, that we're seeing uh, the crisis in, on the southern border. We're working with children and or kids in need of defense. How do we boost? Um, how do we boost programs that will provide legal representation for undocumented minors uh, that are finding themselves in detention? Uh, we'll be expanding that partnership. We know it makes a difference when a child has a lawyer. Uh, they don't fall through the cracks. They don't end up in a foster care system with very little support, or even worse, end up in a, in a, in a trafficking situation. Another thing we've been doing is support for the Refugee Congress. This is a refugee-led gr group comprised of one delegate from each of the 50 states. Each delegate works within their state and collectively at a national level to promote well-being, integration, and dignity for all refugees, asylum seekers, and stateless people in the U.S. They also work to give a voice on the issues and policies affecting their lives with decision makers. This is about our attempts to really work on the advocacy piece. How do we become and amplify a voice for refugees. And I think this kind of hits, Alex, on some of the things that you were talking about um, earlier this evening. I know we've hit time, but there's yeah. one thing I'm dying to know, mm -hmm. which is so cliche. What do you tell the American voice that comes to you and says, I know there are 20 million people who need aid in Yemen, mm -hmm. but we have to fix things at home first. It's so sad, but what's it to me? I've had some of the most interesting hate ma mail in my career in the last two years, and I do get that question a great deal. Why does it have to be a choice is what I don't understand. If, if we're committed, we have to do this everywhere that we can. It's not do it here in the United States instead of supporting what's happening in Africa. You do it in both places, and you've, you've got to find the right balance. Um, but you know, simply focusing here, I don't believe is the solution. And most people, when I point out, you don't have to make a choice. Do both. Do what do they say? a little in each area. It, it seems to be an a, a eye-opening moment. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why. It's pretty simple. Yeah. But um, I don't think we need to make choices. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the other thing I would just say in kind of concluding the remarks is we need everyone on this. And I think um, actually under Alex's leadership, Really, UNHCR started to really, really look at how to engage the private sector. I don't mean just individuals, but also universities, um, the, the service sector, uh, other NGOs, um, and business yeah. that has, if they could bring their best thinking, what drives me nuts is when they bring a particular solution, like use this software package 50 tablets. to plug in. <laughs> what we really need is the American know-how um, the ingenuity, the entrepreneurial spirit, the best thinking this country can bring um, to the issues that are facing refugees, yeah. be it around education, connectivity, yeah. or shelter. Before we go to questions from the floor, I would love to hear from each of you one next thing you'd like to see happen. Just big one. But before you get to that, a little bit of thinking time, I want to ask Alex something. In December, I do, and I'm going to start doing this more often and possibly publicly, I asked our editors at Refugees Deeply to have a one-hour conversation with me, not predicting, because I don't believe in that, but just sharing out, what are the things you think we have to watch in, the refugee, in covering the refugee crisis in the year ahead? So trend lines going in directions that are critical and underreported. And they said, one of the eye-opening things for me, is the, the fallout of the EU-Turkey deal becoming a pattern of essentially extortion by other countries who think that not only does that mean they can, you know, turn up terrible conditions in order to get more funding, which I'm sure has happened for a while, but that particularly they wanted to make sure that the detention of refugees in those countries didn't essentially become black sites that very few reporters can get to where we don't actually know what conditions people are living in. And just this opacity falling over the migration route somehow. And I just wonder if you have any thoughts on that, Is something that concerns you. Um, I, I don't think that's the major problem. I don't, I don't think it's that states have tried to hold up the EU by treating, we're going to treat refugees badly unless you give us money. Kenya made some statement about that initially, but that's 
been taken over by their attempt to close the job. So I, that, I don't think that is, that's not the fallout I see. The fall, I don't blame the refugee hosting states. The, the fallout is that other possible states of movement and secondary movement and resettlement follow that agreement and say we're not going to let people in either. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's where the problem is. It's that there, when the convention was written, the Refugee Convention of the 1950s was written, there, there was no responsibility sharing system put in place. For, for good reason. They were worried about another issue. And, and it just isn't there. I mean, so if there's one, if I can, can I segue to the Please. first question you asked yeah. before I forget it? Um, I mean, I, I actually think, maybe because I served too long in the UN, but um, that the the process started by the declaration with, which will lead to a compact on refugees drafted by UNHCR is the big news, if done well, for this year and into early, into early next year, um, provided it's ambitious enough. And I'm, and I'm worried that the politics of the day means that it won't be ambitious and that we won't end up with a, with a radically different system. But there is, a there is a mechanism for accomplishing a great deal internationally if we seize the moment. Do you worry about the funding and the diversification of funding for UNHCR under this administration? Yeah, um, I don't think the, I mean, I know UNHCR is planning, you know, doing, you know, these sort of scenarios for massive cuts. I don't think Congress will permit the kinds of cuts the Trump, I, the Trump, the Trump budget is a political document. It's not a serious budget. And I, I don't think it'll have that impact. In fact, every year, even under Democratic administrations, the Democratic president would go in with a lower number, and Congress, by, in a bipartisan way, would raise the number for refugees. I, I met on the Hill when I was at UNHCR with members of the Tea Party who would say, hey, you know, this is God's work. We're going to take care of people. So it doesn't mean there won't be some to make cut, but it's not going to be the kind of dramatic cut. But you raise a good point, is that the U.S. shouldn't be bearing 20 30, 40 percent of the overall cost. It should be widely shared countries like India and China and Russia and others should be stepping up and, and doing a lot more than they're doing. Or as Anne-Marie pointed to, the private sector can step in in a serious, in a serious way. Anya, the one thing you'd like to see next? One thing I suppose, um, I suppose for me would be really, and I think Alex referred to it earlier, would be looking at a new way of working. The reality for refugees is they are 17 to 19 years in, as refugees in those countries. And there has to be a better way of working, of bringing the development and humanitarian communities together, looking at solutions, multi-year funding, this idea of your year on year wondering, will you have enough money to deal with the refugees you've got today? Will you have enough money tomorrow for them? Mm -hmm. Instead of coming together as a wide sector and looking at, at really a long-term solution to, to the issues paradigm, mm. you think. Mm. Adrian, one thing you'd like to see? Well, it's sort of a, a slice of what mm. Anya and, and um, Professor Evlenikov have already said. And I, for me, I think it's um, engaging with the concept of resilience, but really drilling down to what um, right to education means. Um, and, and I think there's a really engaged group of people. And I I also think that this is part of a more a larger global conversation that's happening around how uh, like student data mobility in Europe, for example, and the European uh, recognition of higher education credentials community. I think there are really interesting models that are available and that can be made responsive to the most vulnerable. It, it really can be done. I think it is. Um, not a magic bullet, and I and I think there are plenty of people who would say, you know, access to education is not going to give people the right to work. It's not going to solve all their problems. But I think there are a lot of really important benefits that you get just by being better educated. There are documented health benefits, uh, maternal child. But I mean, there's so many. There is no reason not to invest in education, whether it's K through 12 or uh, higher education, because it will be better for returnees and it will be better for the host societies they live in. And I think it just makes a lot of sense. So that's what I would like to, and that's also what I work on. So. <laughs> fair, fair, fair link. Anne-Marie, one thing you'd like to see? Sure. So I'd agree with everything my uh, fellow panelists have said, and um, maybe I'll take it to a, a granular 
granular level here. I spoke about urbanization, and one of the most effective ways of delivering aid is cash assistance. Um, and we've been very, very successful in, in getting Americans to actually sponsor, uh, for want of a better word, families living in Lebanon and Jordan with direct cash assistance, is at helping to educate donors that this is some of the most effective aid that can be delivered. It provides people with a choice. It gives them dignity. It gives them a sense of self-worth. And they become, again, responsible to a large part for themselves, the control they have in their own life. It's the most effective aid we can deliver. Uh, helping Americans to understand that would be tremendous. Any questions from the floor? Start in the back. Can you raise your hand? Oh, yes. sorry. 13. Hi, thank you very much. Um, let me just say, this has been an incredibly informative panel. Um, so thank you all for being here and sharing all your knowledge. Um, what I found listening to you, though, was that a lot of the information um, we talked about was very much geared at people who are already on our side, who are global citizens, who get the need for action and to improve the situation that we are facing right now. And it feels a bit like we've essentially given up on those who are skeptical. We maybe even treat them a bit condescending, saying that they just don't get it. And we give them a very high level narrative of moral imperatives and human rights, but we do a very bad job, I feel, of explaining to them why that is important and how potential solutions could be implemented. And my concern is that by failing to address those fears or insecurities, we're essentially fueling populist right-wing movements. And by inc increasing that over the longer term, we'll actually face more difficulties of implementing our ideas on a political level. So I'd like to see your views on that. So first, some good news. Yeah. <laughs> I, don't, I didn't bring it into this panel discussion to date, but there is actually a lot of good work being done that members of this panel have been part of or an instigate, have instigated. Sometimes it's under the banner of changing the narrative, but I do think it's very much on everyone's minds here communicating to those who don't yet understand why these issues are important. We were with some folks from Airbnb today. They put mm -hmm. up a Super Bowl ad that wasn't cheap. And so there's a lot of science and communications work being done in this space. But it's a good observation and Yeah, yeah, totally, totally. Totally. Absolutely. And yeah. Anne Marie and Alex, I think you might have some thoughts. So, so actually I think this has been a vision that we've had. Um, I, I think it began well before my time, Alex, but uh, we I was lucky enough to be uh, with Alex's support to lead the development of this group in New York called the Hive. And very much it was not about taking the traditional approach of looking at our supporter base and modeling that, but rather saying, what are the barriers that are pre preventing other Americans from embracing this issue or understanding it? And we've done deep data-based modeling. We can assign literally a score, a profile score, to every American that's of voting age. Um, we've taken the best of what the private sector does in this field and tried to apply it to our work. We did 21 different experiments reaching out to audiences that we would never have dreamed of going to, from conservative Christians uh, to Latino populations to uh, people that have advocated very heavily on climate change. And we can actually see, I mean, that is expensive work. It is playing a much longer term uh, game. Uh, you can't look at a return on investment in the traditional communications or fundraising um, return on investment uh, metrics. You're playing this for a longer piece. But what we found is with conservative Christians, there were definitely populations that could be swayed, and we learned the right messages to get to them. Uh, we learned what the right those? platforms to do it. it any from, from many conservative groups, uh, we had to take anything that resembled UN out of the messaging entirely. We had to focus on um, particular religious um, verses that encourage uh, a Christian approach. <laughs> um, 
and and they're there. And they're, when I find with the what led us into really our success in in 2015 was watching the response we were getting out of these communities as it related to un the unaccompanied minors coming over the um, the borders from Mexico. And people were saying, but wait a minute, this isn't politics, these are children. We have a moral responsibility. And that's the theme that we went with and we've been able to keep a number of those people with us. Um, for us, it skews a particular way. I won't go into the psychographics and demographics. We're doing that kind of work. We're hoping to get more funding um, from the private sector to continue that work. I think it's being done, but the results will take a longer time. I, we have to make choices on how we spend donor money and to use it properly. We have to demonstrate that response. So I think it's a question of finding the right balance. But I absolutely agree. There are only about 4.5 million Americans that would raise their hand and say, I support refugee causes. But we've been able to ad identify close to 16 million Americans that we call persuadables, that with the right messaging on the right platform through the right lens, mm -hmm. will come to the cause. And we do this for the purpose of changing perceptions, not simply for fundraising. Alex, I think you'd like to add? Just very, very briefly. Um, I think the work has to be done at a cultural level as well. And I think we need to hear your views on this, about mm -hmm. how we reach people these days. I mean, so in my view, if, if we had major TV shows that people watch where Syrian refugees were major characters and they were made human, and it might do a lot more than every picture we put up of a, a child who has been harmed in some way. I mean, I think it's, it's humanizing, it's making them like us, but I, I'm not an expert on that. Um, the other thing I would say is that the, the way that people, it, it was a very good question because the, the, there's a fear in people at this point. We've allowed the, the populist movements to, to, make, to take refugees and make them something to be scared of. It's, it's very odd to me that Syrian refugees haven't been described as people fleeing terror and fleeing Assad, fleeing ISIS and fleeing Assad, who are enemies of the United States. Well, used to be, well, <laughs> Assad, we don't know, but, right? I mean, in the same way that Cubans were welcomed in because of the political message, it's, it's just odd to me we haven't been able to take that political message. And rather, we've allowed other people to say these are possible terrorists. It's very bizarre to me. The, that goes to really for, for that, People need to feel secure about these processes. And I think the, the really crucial thing that policymakers can do if they want to change public opinions is to show management of the situation. So the, it's, it's, the, it's the, the mass arrival of people that worries people. If in the Syrian crisis, Europe had gotten together early on and said, we will take 100,000 refugees a year from these countries, or 200,000, and we'll distribute them. They'd done that in year one. Um, you wouldn't have seen the secondary movement, the people coming by boat, the smugglers and the criminals and the, and the, and the walls going up. But because it was unmanaged, people resorted to, to criminal gangs or on their own two feet or boat sinking boats, and they came to places where people, they weren't invited and people didn't want them. And that led to the, so it just seems on, on all these issues that a, a well-functioning, well-managed system will allay fears and allow people to be more generous and, you know, and then and these appeals can be successful. I'm very sorry to say that my industry is somewhat responsible here for the failure of comprehension, since we are responsible for public education and adult education on global issues. Um, and so I do think that culture, this is part culture failure, part media failure, for refugees equals mus Muslims equal bad. So cultural creation, to Alex's point, is crucial. And what an amazing comedian like Aziz Ansari does for people's perception of Muslims should be studied in another PhD thesis. <coughs> but um, for those here who are planning to be journalists, let me just point to, I think, a big failure around the refugee narrative has been the lack of nuance and as much as I admire and love my colleagues, we tend to treat most stories that matter either as a, in a in, as a vacuum, as in there's nothing on it, like Syria for the first three years or so, it's practically a vacuum, or a fetish. And when it's fetish time, everyone jumps in along a very similar approach. And I love and bless those who 
put on a backpack and went on the refugee trail for their own gonzo approach to what it's like to cross a border as a refugee. But every, I would like to count how many people did that story. <laughs> Whereas the follow-up, the no maxi pad story, the polio and what it means for societies, what drug resistant uh, tuberculosis could mean if refugee po populations go unchecked, nuanced stories are missing. And so it makes it much harder for people to grasp implications, humanity, dignity, because we've practically turned even refugee coverage into a voyeuristic exercise for the glorification of an individual reporter and their airtime. I'm not a media critic, but I'm going to play one for a second. And I'm a former fellow at the Tau Center, so I feel responsible for sharing that. But it's, it's, really, it's really problematic. And what does or doesn't get communicated, and the deployment of journalists abroad, which is a largely commercial decision at the individual newsroom level, has real implications. And we see that in the failure of the understanding around the refugee narrative. And I believe we see that in the rise of Islamophobia in the United States. Because the way we as an industry covered 9-11 and the aftermath and the many years to follow have shaped public perceptions and public levels of Islamophobia. And we have to take responsibility for that. Because the way, the, you know, I believe it was unconscionable and now we're seeing the effects. We have time for one more very quick question. Okay. Hi, uh, some of my question you answer, but I will try. Um, one thing is uh, I have the privilege to do my thesis about refugees and I've been working with um, a bunch of young leaders on refugee camps. So one is the missing part, a missing part is the amazing resiliency in face of losing a family member and how they're, on post how they're working through their own, own uh, post-trauma. Second, going back to the culture, uh, we have neighbors in Canada they have amazing programs that I also uh, witness where the community itself picking one family and they're literally doing local fundraising and you're taking them to the, uh, school and you're taking them to uh, the grocery store, etc. Et so my question is why that is not happening here? And secondly, going back to uh, communication and media, there was this viral video which was pretty beautiful. This uh, white male... Um, a refugee uh, Syrian family moved in and he always uh, was Islamophobic and then he met them and he's talking about his transformation. So how can we create that kind of media viral but also in-depth reporting to change your perception? More often than not, they're the same, which is amazing. That's how you find those stories. Yeah. Anne-Marie, private sponsorship systems? Yeah, I think um, there's a uh, Sloan Davidson from Pittsburgh has recently developed a, um, a database, a database of all of the people can self-populate it, all of the groups across the United States um, and trying to match that with volunteers. So there, we indeed in almost, in many, many communities, we find church groups, schools coming together to sponsor a resettled refugee family. I know my own community is, is doing that in Connecticut. Uh, those stories are there. We just need to amplify them. Um, and those are the, ty the kinds of narrative that we are trying to push out is, is very positive, to move away from the, the crying child, just focusing on need, to really show the connection where Americans can make a difference and how refugees are people just like us, except for um, a stroke of fate. So can I add one more thing quickly? We're literally at time, so I want to hold to the integrity of the panel, but we're here for at least five minutes. <laughs> Please come up after. Please join me in thanking our panelists. I and makes a major impact on mm -hmm. all, the, all the refugees in the world. And, and you give us yeah. energy for tomorrow. Yeah. Seriously. Yeah. Thank you guys so much. Thank you for your panel. Laura, panel for our panel, thank you so much. This was an extraordinary, sobering, uh, but critical call to action. So thank you so much for, for everything. Appreciate it. And, and that convenes the process. I want to thank Azine, Meredith, Connie, 
Jacqueline, I can't see who else is here, Kim, Fanera, the whole group that organized this. Please join me in thanking them for organizing this event. And now there is a reception out in the foyer, I pres presume, yes. Uh, so please come and join us. Thank you. Nice.